Elise terns are migratory beach nesting birds that are actually found uh, throughout North America. But we have a specific population here called the California Elise tern. And they historically nest along beachfronts. And if you were in Los Angeles 100 years ago, you would have found them anywhere from Santa Monica to Long Beach. California Elise terns are federally endangered. They are in a precarious predicament because of the fact that they require sandy, open, coastal beaches to breed in and on. Uh, but as we have begun to use more of the beaches for human recreation, which means grooming them uh, and taking the seaweed off and taking the natural topography away, we have reduced the number of areas that these terns can nest. And so the terns have been squeezed and squeezed and squeezed um, into a smaller and smaller area to the point where about 25 years ago, um, an area was set aside, fenced by a chain link fence, ostensibly for the least terns to use for nesting purposes. And so we have such a site adjacent to the Biona wetlands on Venice Beach that may at certain years have as many as 300 nesting pairs. The challenge for us in managing this site is that American crows have keyed in on these birds as potential sources of food. Crows are arguably one of the two or three most intelligent non-human species on the planet. They live 20 to 30 years. They have phenomenally complex social systems, wide variety of diet. Uh, they're highly territorial, increasingly com complex when we look at what they do in cities. So one of the fascinating things about studying the least turns, I have to be honest, is we get to study the crows. And so the the crows, in essence, have figured out the situation. They associate the sound of uh, least turn vocalizations, which occur only in the spring for the most part and summer, with the presence of this food um, that is available in the form of eggs when the birds nest. Crows are having a huge impact on least turns. The crows predate on the least turn eggs, so um, they basically have been eating all of the eggs that the least turns have been producing in the Venice Beach Colony for the past um, five years. Now in nature, this problem ameliorates itself because the least terns, after having a year in which, for instance, they might have heavy predation from crows, they simply move to another site somewhere else along the beachfront. But because we groom the beach now, they're the only places these birds can nest are those locations that we set up for them and fence off. But the first thing we need to do with the site is actually to figure out what crows are there. What crows are using that site, where the terns are nesting, where are those crows being recruited from? In order for our study to work, we would need somewhat of a stable population around the tern colony because we would hope to have the same crows each day um, going into the colony and learning not to eat the eggs. So for the past couple of years, we've actually focused our energies on putting unique sequences of color bands on the legs of these crows and then on five select crows putting radio transmitters that allow us to track where these crows uh, are coming from and where they're being recruited from. So what we did is about three weeks before we actually trapped the crows, we started putting out peanuts uh, weekly, about three times a week, just to get the crows you know, used to coming in and also for us just as an observer to see roughly how many crows from the area came in to eat the peanuts. The day we banded and trapped them, we set up an Australian bird trap, which is essentially just like a box with um, the ladder in between. So the ladder serves as the door for the crows to come in, and they can easily come in. However, they can't come out because the ladder is just small enough so that they can't actually open their wings and fly out. We deploy the trap for three to six hours. Then we have someone go in with the net to catch each one individually and then have a system to pass it on to another person who bands them another person who weighs them and does other data measurements. And then if we're all putting radio transmitters, that's, that's attached through a tethered rope and also super glue. The radio transmitter is not supposed to affect the bird's flying abilities whatsoever. Um, they have multiple tail feathers and we just put it on one or two. The feathers will eventually molt off, so the radio transmitter is only expected to be on the bird for a maximum of six months because they do go through regular molting, but hopefully in that six months we will be able to see where they go. So in a situation like this where we have a conflict between a predator and prey species, uh, in nature these systems work their, themselves out. 
And so in nature, these terns would simply get up and nest somewhere else uh, and other available habitat. So one solution would be for the state to allocate or the county to allocate more nesting areas along the beach so that the terns could, could choose from a variety of sites in any given year. And if the predation rates were high in one year, they'd simply move to another location. In the medium or long term, that may be one of the solutions we investigate. In the short term, this combination of understanding where the crows are coming from, what age group and social status of crows are, are working these uh, nesting areas, it may help us to figure out which uh, aversion techniques would be most effective. In the past, what they have done is just simply shot the crows or hung crow carcasses over the fence. Appropriately or inappropriately, that was the first kind of step, um, which proved to be futile because there are just are so many crows in urban areas because of extended amounts of food sources that no matter how many crows you kill, dozens and dozens of crows, there's still plenty more crows to replace those crows. So taking out a territorial crow family, you're likely to get two or three transient families that move in. So our lab is taking the tack that we might be able to actually train the crows not to like the eggs. We are encouraged by the idea that negative um, conditioning can work on the crows to deter them from eating least turn eggs because um, crows live in very sophisticated social structures. They're very intelligent so that they do a lot of vicarious learning. But with support from the California Department of Fish and Game, we have done experiments that uh, we've used an emetic in the eggs, which uh, we put down um, dummy eggs that are not real turn eggs, or at least not the real eggs that are filled with developing baby turns. These are mimics. And we put fluid inside the eggs that the crows will eat, and it makes them feel sick. Doesn't hurt them, makes them feel sick. It's called an emetic. And hopefully, crows would eat the eggs, get sick, and then learn not to eat those eggs. Unfortunately, the lag time between associating sickness with the eating of the eggs was too long so that the crows weren't able to make a successful association. There are other methods that you can deter the crow, sometimes with sound, sometimes with color, and also potentially um, low voltage electric shocks, like you have an electric fence. You touch an electric fence, you get the shock, you move away. And so we modified the uh, technology used for electric fences and deliver a shock such that when the crow touched one of the replica eggs, um, it would shock itself and that would dissuade the crow, hopefully, um, from trying to touch other or additional eggs. And it would also, perhaps more importantly, um, serve as an example to other crows that were associated with it because they could see this immediate reaction and correlate it to the presence of the turn egg. So there's a whole variety of things that we can or are experimenting with models for trying. Another interesting challenge is that when the terns are all on their nests, they're very effective at defending themselves against crows. Uh, least terns are diving birds. They have a rapier sword-like bill that's actually quite a weapon. And it can do quite a bit of damage to a crow if they physically interact. But these, the terns are fish eaters, so they actually have to go out to sea to catch fish. The population of fish that they go after have been moving farther and farther offshore. So they have to be off the nest longer periods of time to get fish in order to come back, which opens the window wider for predation to take place from the marauding crows. So one of the great things about doing these kinds of science projects is that the public can be involved at many different levels. We have a philosophy here at the Center for Urban Resilience that goes something like this. There's a lot of great science to be done. Let's choose the ones that the public can be involved with, because that has two really good outcomes. One, we hope it improves the quality of the science by having more participants. But second, and arguably equal in value, is that we create more stakeholders who understand the importance of the work being done and importance of their role of what it means to be a citizen. You know, not a political statement, but an actual functional statement. What does it mean to be a citizen in a rich and resilient natural community that cities can be? So we need folks to track these uh, crows that have the radio transmitters on them, and you can do that by uh, uh, checking out one of our radio transmitters and, and taking a short course with us on how to do uh, radio tracking. 
Um, you can participate as a volunteer at the nesting site, counting turns and gathering behavioral data on the arrival and uh, uh, movement patterns of crows. Uh, so we have lots of projects ongoing and there's plenty of opportunities for the general public, for undergraduates, for graduate students, uh, and casual uh, sort of unintentional science folks to be involved in the programs that we're doing.